speaking up and active, people active in their communities, that I'm not talking about a fringe minority or a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the mainstream media. The media today represents a minority elite. These all have to be challenged, and many people are doing it. It's Michael Franti here. This is Amy Goodman with Rochester. Rochester Indian Media. Hi there, you are tuned in. We're gonna hopefully turn you on today and get you participating. This isn't about the 60s slogan of tune in, turn on, and drop out, but it's come on board and participate and get involved because there's a lot of groups we talk to and a lot of people we talk to doing incredible things that need help. And as long as people know, there's always something you can do. And you know, we hope to show you some of those things over the weeks and months of our show so people can get involved. I'm the Barefoot host of the Rochester Indie Media TV show, and today we are going to talk with Kim Clark from Free, Families Rally for Emancipation and Empowerment. And Kim is here from New York City. Thank you so much for being here today. This is really exciting for us because this is a last minute show we whooped together in order to get some of the information that Kim has about the Rockefeller drug laws and the agency she works for. and the work you guys are doing. So let's start out, Kim, today just talking about your role as the director of FREE and the work that you do with this organization and what brings you to Rochester. So welcome to Rochester. Thank you, Dawn. Um, FREE started actually as the Prison Families Community Forum in 2002 out of Brooklyn. We were part of a community development corporation. And we were just a little program uh, looking at what we could do to bring people who are impacted by mass incarceration together on the outside. So uh, we started as a collective of people who have incarcerated loved ones and we've grown into an itty bitty nonprofit organization, grassroots style. Um, still based in Brooklyn right now, but our work is statewide a lot of the time. We do self-advocacy trainings, peer-to-peer -peer support, we're embarking on a little bit of media justice work, and uh, we do grassroots organizing. So a lot of our campaigns have a statewide <laughs> impact. For example, we started the Stop the Contract campaign, which was just a few folks who were upset about their high telephone bills whenever they had to receive a collect call from prison and it grew into the New York campaign for telephone justice um, much to the credit of uh, Annette Dickerson and Marion Rodriguez out of um, both Prison Families Community Forum and uh, the Center for Constitutional Rights and after a little bit over a three-year struggle we were able to get the cost of calls reduced by 50% across the state and save Which people, people might not know. I mean, those are really exorbitant costs and charges, which is another way of keeping people alienated who become incarcerated often to begin with with excessive um, penalties for sometimes minor offenses and then they're separated from their community by going off to some f distant prison and then they have a difficulty in calling so it makes it impossible to keep relationships with people. Exactly and relationships are really important and that's part of you know freeze focus because we were focusing on the family and keeping the family together and when you sever those ties like that then you're really asking for recidivism you're asking for someone to come back out and most people are released at some point regardless of um, the the crime or the sentence at some point they come home wherever home is and uh, without being adept at relationships and um, you know without really having maintained those connections 
um, the reintegration is very much more difficult. How did you get drawn to this work? Did you, was it a personal situation for you as well? Did you have a loved one incarcerated? You know, I have um, I have a sort of relative who's incarcerated, um, and it wasn't so much that. I mean, I see my niece and nephew. You know, their father is incarcerated, and that's. Um, making a very negative impact on their life. But honestly, I got involved because I was starting to make a documentary about uh, how almost dollar for dollar, Pataki was funneling money into constructing prisons and out of higher education opportunity programs. So I was very interested in that. And um, you know, I have many, many friends who are amazing leaders in various communities, especially in New York City, who are first generation college students and would never have had that opportunity to excel academically without the educational opportunity program. And to look around and imagine them, you know, not having been there um, really sparked my interest in, in exploring further. And then I got completely sucked into seeing that there's this enormous um, network of people who have incarcerated loved ones. I mean, if you figure there's 66,000 people <coughs> in New York who are incarcerated, so I don't know, family of four or cousins or whoever, like how many people are impacted by those people being locked up? And there's two million in the whole country in prison right now. Mm -hmm. It's huge numbers. I mean, the, the prison industrial complex is so large and growing that as we start talking about the Rockefeller drug laws, which I'd like you to first set up and explain what this is and where this came from, I want to know proportionally as that law came if it's been really great business, you know, for the prison industrial complex. So first, what is Rockefeller drug law? Where does this come from and what's the consequence of this law currently mm -hmm. in New York? It's just a New York State law? It is a New York State law. In 1973, uh, Nelson Rockefeller decided, you know, he was gonna personally take out all the drug kingpins in New York and instituted mandatory minimum drug laws. So uh, much of the sentencing was a mandatory of 15 years to life for drug-related offenses. Um, and so that's been 35 years to, you know, almost today. And that's just including that possession. That's just including possession. A great deal of people who are incarcerated under these laws are first-time nonviolent drug-related of offenders. So, um, in essence, although like I, I had actually seen a news clip with Anthony Papa, who's a, a, a spokesperson on the issue, and he was saying, you know, I've never. He served a lot of time under Rockefeller drug laws. He said, I've never seen a kingpin in prison <laughs> and you know there's a lot of politics and money behind that but um, essentially what the Rockefeller drug laws are are mandatory minimum laws which although now the the minimum I think is eight years eight to 21 years the judge has no discretion everything is up to the to the DA to decide and um, no matter what the case then you're getting eight years. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk more about the dr Rockefeller drug laws and the reforms that are on the horizon. See you in a bit. Who sells a gram and who sells a ton? Like any big business, you're small and you're gone. By gone, I mean you mess with Rockefeller. Laws are made by the ton seller. Show me the money and the crack and the weed and the coke and the speed and everything I need to put you away. Three strikes, okay. You'll be separated from your seat and meeting. Si la policía tira, tiren. Ellos no están aquí para abusarnos, no. La prochaine fois, c'est moi qui viens pour toi. Si tu despar, je vais te couper les doigts. Miren, si la policía tira, tiren. Ellos no están aquí para abusarnos, no. La prochaine fois, c'est moi qui viens pour toi. Si tu despar, je vais te couper les doigts. Al diablo con las leyes de este Rockefeller 
anti better fed for my spliff and they rip like I'm causing some grief to the men and the tío llamado Sam. We're back. You're watching Indie TV, and today in the studio we have Kim Clark, who came up to present at hearings in front of the assembly, talking about the Rockefeller drug laws and the reforms that need to be made. And some of the footage that you just saw during the break happened in New York City last fall at the Sentencing Commission hearings. And Kim's going to talk about that, and as well as more on the Rockefeller drug laws. So I don't know where we want to start now, but uh, let's set up the hearings that are going on to make some reforms in this excessive criminalization and penalizing of um, drug offenses. So mm -hmm. let's start there, I guess. Well, what's interesting about these hearings that um, were set up by the assembly are that they were joint assembly hearings. So you had all the different committees from the assembly that intersect where you might see public health working. And so in the past, you know, this this law these laws have been studied to death. There's tons of statistics, you know, we know that it costs $32,000 a year to lock someone up for drugs, but it's like 4500 for outpatient drug treatment. Um, we know that $200 million a year would be saved if we were not locking people up for drug related um, offenses. So it's about the money. Someone's making money somewhere. Someone is definitely making a lot of money somewhere. Prisons are privatized. As you said earlier, you know, it's a prison industrial complex. Um, and yeah, it would be interesting to really see who's benefiting from this. The majority of New Yorkers are against these laws. Um, they destroy families, destroy communities. Um, and cost us a lot of money. Like, what would we do with $200 million a year in New York State? I know Rochester is a particularly economically downtrodden city. Um, it'd be interesting to hear from folks about, like, what would you do with, you know, that money? How would you improve your town? And especially when what we're looking at is not, you know, what in many countries and even other states see as crime. It's, um, it's drugs. So if folks are addicted or if folks are impoverished and selling drugs because there's no other economic opportunities, um, we need to really be looking at the roots of, of where this is coming from and we need to be taking more of an approach of, of healing instead of penalizing. Um, is that what's been coming out in the hearings? Is this are most of the people um, speaking at the hearings really against the Rockefeller drug laws and wanting to see reform? And what are the angles that people are coming out with? Well, pretty much other than the district attorneys who, you know, their jobs depend on, you know, this kind of thing. They have a lot of power under these laws. They have more power than a judge in 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 the case of mandatory minimums because the judge can say, wow, you know, Dawn, it's her first time, you know, she has kids, whatever, um, we should help her out, but he can't or she can't, their hands are tied. Uh, and the, only the district attorney can recommend drug treatment or, you know, any other options at this point. Um, most everyone else is calling for alternatives to incarceration and more resources for them, um, various types of, of support mechanisms. You know, it's funny, uh, I understand there's a TV show called Celebrity Rehab. Hmm. What's really good with that? Like, where's hmm. our celebrity rehab? Hmm. You know, <laughs> like, we don't have, we don't have a, ch if it was me getting caught with, I guess, let's say four ounces of cocaine, I'm not getting rehab. I'm not getting any breaks. Mm -hmm. You're not going to see me again for eight years. And they is don't want to show your treatment on TV because it's not going to be, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and is that helping? It's not helping. We need, to, we need to look at how we can make our communities better and stronger and reinvest that $200 million into those devastated communities. In, it, like I'd say, I'm, I'm just being rough here, about 80% of the 15,500 people locked up in New York State under these laws come from seven neighborhoods in New York City that are basically um, 
broke, disenfranchised, neglected communities of color. And, um, you know, my family's from Liverpool, New York. I've never seen someone stopped to be searched or, you know, uh, patted down in that neighborhood. But in Harlem, where I live now, I mean, it's all the time, and I see it in Rochester, too. And what's the relationship you have with the families then, with a lot of this population that you're talking about who's incarcerated right now? Do you have close contact and how do you help the families? In well, our approach, <coughs> our approach is um, less help, like we're not a direct service organization. Mm -hmm. We're a grassroots group and we're looking to empower folks to find their own ways of, mm -hmm. of piecing their lives back together and improving their lives. So um, the peer-to-peer -peer support mm -hmm. um, is what we offer. It's not like a clinical type of a mm -hmm. thing. We do um, refer people to s direct service organizations, but mainly our focus is if you're being hurt by um, a policy or a law or a practice, then how do we come together as people impacted by that and fight and um, create change, you know, mm -hmm. create alternatives. In this case, you know, the real fight is with the Senate. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of senators who benefit from prevailing over prison towns. Mm -hmm. And in those towns, um, the, uh, a good majority of the people who count as numbers in the census so that they have a district, they're incarcerated and they can't vote. Mm -hmm. So For they're disempowered and mm -hmm. disenfranchised. And they're chilling, so why would they mm -hmm. change that? Mm -hmm. um, the assembly, the majority of New Yorkers in countless polls, um, and the governor who himself has been arrested protesting these very laws, Everyone wants to see them gone, but right now we're going to have to really look at um, what's the holdup in the Senate. You know, maybe we can dig around and really find out um, mm -hmm. other ways that folks are, are benefiting from this that we don't even know. We have only 30 seconds for this se uh, segment, but what are you feeling in general? What's the feeling about the hearings? How would you classify what you're thinking about them? Well, I'd say two things. I'm very hopeful. Um, I, I, I'm hopeful to see uh, the assembly drafting something out of what they've heard um, that will result in real reform, um, not just you know what has been done in the recent past, but also um, I felt that, especially in Rochester, that people were left out of the process, and I'd like to see folks come out and and chime in about it. Come in, get involved. Community TV, back in a moment. Oh, hi. I'm Steve Heiss. I'm the producer and editor of the Indie Media Newsreel, which is the program you're watching right now. Or, well, I mean... Very, very important message. So listen very carefully. Not now, now. Because now, now, I'm recording this, and then I have to edit it. And But, but I mean... For your now, right now, as you're watching this, it's now. Um, well, anyway. Um, Newsreel is a monthly program that's been in production for about seven years. Every month, activist video producers from around the country, around the world even, send in video segments about events in their communities. Events where people are standing up for what they believe in and trying to make a difference in the world. However, we have a problem. Lately, for whatever reason, when I sit down toward the end of the month to work on putting together the next month's program, I look at the pile of submissions sent to me, and, well, that pile's been pretty empty. For some reason, people just aren't sending very much in. And I'm not sure why, but I need contributions to make the show happen. I can't just make it out of thin air. I need other people's documentaries little documentaries, two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, about things going on around them in their communities. So if you're watching this and you like this program, maybe you can help. Maybe you make videos or know someone who does. Someone who's involved with a local struggle and wants to document that struggle 
or maybe someone who's already making short little documentaries and wants more opportunities to get the word out about what they're doing. There's more details about this project at newsreel.indymedia.org. You're watching Rochester Indie TV, Rochester Indie Media. This is community television at its best. We're figuring out as we go along what we're going to be talking about today because there is so much to say about this topic. Uh, we were talking about the Rockefeller drug laws and um, the hearings that are happening right now to reform this and see this um, overturned. What could, how do you imagine if these laws, you know, if this was to just be erased now, there is no Rockefeller drug law, how we deal with the crime happening from um, drug use, from drug violence, how do we um, keep a hold of that and how would we handle the situation? Well, it's interesting. I could see various scenarios. I think that, for example, when we stop thinking of drugs as a crime and you know we think of it as public health issues, there's so many things around drugs that are ironic. Like first of all, marijuana is a plant um, that hasn't yet been patented. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not even sure how that ever happened that it was able to become a narcotic and classified as such and treated as such. Um, alcohol has been found to be way more harmful <laughs> and, and way more addictive. Um, violence that's drug related is usually someone who's addicted who's trying to um, get what they need. Uh, or, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, or it's based around money. So, you know, we're talking about addiction, we're talking about poverty. So, um, again, like, for example, I visited Holland, and, you know, that's, you know, a lot of folks know that although it's not technically legal to, to smoke or possess marijuana in, in Amsterdam or in Holland, it's just a non-issue. And you don't see folks running around crazed, high, you know, committing crimes. The police are not armed. There's a whole other environment. I feel like when we decriminalize drugs, then we're forced to deal with one another in another kind of way. Like, you're struggling, and I'm struggling, and how do we struggle together, and how do we work together to make, um, you know, ourselves stronger? And you know, I think uh, our society has become like, you know, instant gratification. Oh, I don't want to see that. Remove it. Oh, I don't like this. You know, banish it. And meanwhile, it's not an accident that there's, you know, two million people incarcerated in the United States. And, and like in Ghana, West Africa, it was like maybe 12,000 people in prison in the whole country. So why is that? Because it's, it's big business and because this country, you know, was built on slavery and exploitation. And now that we're the, the bigger country and <laughs> there's allegedly no slavery, we look at the 13th Amendment and it says, unless you are convicted of a felony. So hey, you know, easy, easy way to um, get more numbers, get more bodies, fill more beds, need to build more structures, mm -hmm. just criminalize something that it, you know, and, and then, you know, look at the differences like in urban areas, low income folks are probably outside smoking some marijuana. So, you know, you could quickly catch somebody and um, no one's going into suburban homes mm -hmm. to see, you know, what kind of stash folks have, you know, or no one's going into, you know, um, conv you know, conventions uh, that, you know, high up CEOs and so forth are part of where, you know, there's tons of drugs, the modeling industry, mm -hmm. back to celebrity rehab, right? If you look at even, you know, without drugs, in some ways, <laughs> we probably wouldn't have a lot of the music and art it's and creative force things. <laughs> it's not all about violence. <laughs> that, that we have, you know, I mean, there's so many people and, and once they, once they pass on, then it's like, oh, the tragic life of this person and the mm -hmm. turbulence and whatever. But while they're living, we don't do anything to address 
like them feeling dehumanized or uh, isolated or alienated or any of the you know things surrounding um, depression or hopelessness, despair. But we'll you know glamorize it later after they're gone if they're a well-known celebrity or if they're someone who had a lot of money. But um, racism runs deep in mm -hmm. this country, and it's still a very big elephant in and the people room. People are producing in the prisons too. Part of the economy is you know these incarcerated individuals are making what like underwear for Victoria's Secrets or whatever the business is happening there. That yes. then you know where's the profit margin? Larger for the CEOs and the you know smaller elite you know at the backs mm -hmm. of. Um, punished, you know, struggling individuals, like you said, and often they just, you know, there's actually a lot of innocent people in there, mm -hmm. too, that mm -hmm. uh, we don't talk about. But I'd like to know, do you um, go into the prisons as well with your work and talk to people, or what kind of relationship do you have with prisoners, and how do you keep in touch? Because I think prisoner, you know, correspondence is really important, and that's one thing people watching might want to get involved with. And can we speak about things that people can do who want to work to change the system, who are out there struggling with a loved one? How can people stay connected? get involved? Well, you know, I'd say a couple things. In terms of freeze work, we mainly try to um, strengthen the folks who are doing the support work um, for their family member. Uh, so in terms of our membership and our leaders, they do go into the prisons to visit their loved ones. And um, we do do outreach um, to folks, but it's a very tricky thing sometimes. I mean, we do, we have times when we do prisoner correspondence on um, like around different holidays and things like that. Um, but it's also very tricky in terms of how you reach out to folks on the inside because folks can be, you know, get in trouble, in trouble for, um, it's pretty random and it's like not consistent what people can get in trouble for. Um, but, you know, I wanted to t say that in Rochester in particular, I think there's a couple things because, you know, um, if I might be so bold as to say, this is really a Jim Crow town. <gasps> Did I say that? Well, yeah, it, it is. I mean, I lived here for 15 months and it was really hard to find people of color in any decision-making capacity almost. And, you know, you just look, it's like the whole city is segregated. I think that one thing is that people need to stand up and come together and realize that it's not just you, it's not just your cousin, it's not just your son, it's a whole bunch of folks. There's two million families in the country right now and every year, so don't um, be ashamed. And also I understand there's a children's, um, the Rochester Children's Zone is giving away I hate money. To cut you off. Someone's Ooh. giving away money? I don't know, but well, you know, we have a limited time. We're going to have Kim Clark come back and talk to us more about this. There's so much information and thank you for coming and speaking to us today. And Community TV ends with a hug or a handshake and I'm going to give you, you a hug. Thank you.